Okay, I guess we can start now. Welcome everyone to this keynote talk session. My name is Saya Isama and I work as a professor of Finnish literature here at the University of Tampere. And we have invited our keynote speaker here. I am very pleased to introduce you Professor Rafaela Paccolini. She works as, as professor of English at the University of Bologna, Italy. Professor Paccolini has published widely on 20th century literature and film, genre studies, drama studies, memory, modernism, and nostalgia, to mention just a few topics, I guess. She has also numerous publications on science fiction, utopia and dystopia. To mention some of her work on dystopian fiction, she has edited with Tom Oyvan two important collections of articles, Dark Horizons, Science Fiction and the Utopian Imagination, was published in 2003, and Utopia Method Vision, The Use Value of Social Dreaming, was published in 2007. She has also written several articles and book chapters on dystopian utopian writers, from Charles Perkins Tillman to Perkin, Orville, Atwood, and Percy. Today, she is going to give a talk with the title, Dare to Distal. Dare to Disturb, Reading Unhappy Endings in Young Adults' Dystopia. Please welcome Professor Paccolini. Thank you very much. And um, I would like to start with thanking Saya and Hannah and Kaisa and Lisa uh, and all the people, all the, that as uh, have made this day wonderful and have been taking such good care of, care of me. And um, uh, I, didn't I didn't prepare any PowerPoint. Uh, I was going to do the lecture old style, just talking. <laughs> and uh, uh, what I'm going to talk about is um, uh, it's actually a work in progress. I've been working, reading um, young adult dystopias for a while. And uh, today I'm presenting some of my reflection on these two uh, standalone novels. So I'm not going to talk about the very successful young dystopias that you probably all know, starting with Hunger Games uh, or Divergent or other such novels. But I'm going to talk about um, these, uh, these novels that were written before, before the, uh, the great spread of uh, um, young adult dystopias. And um, Anthony Anderson's Feet is a novel published in 2002 uh, in North America. Uh, and then I thought that I'd bring, you know, an unusual uh, voice uh, since science fiction, you know, utopia dystopia is not so much Italian as a, as a genre. Um, and um, so I, uh, I'll be talking also about uh, Beatrice Mazzini who is the translator of Harry Potter in Italy. Uh, she's also a writer, translator, and editor. Um, and this is her first foray into the dystopian genre, uh, Bambini del Bosco, uh, which roughly translate, which translates into um, children in the wood, or kids in the wood. Um, and this was published in 2010. And um, so they, they worked together, uh, or at least they decided to, to work on both of them, uh, because they are addressed at different uh, age groups. As you know, age is a big theme in uh, children's and young adult dystopias. Um, and, that, and because they are standalone, not trilogies that seem to be uh, so famous and so popular today. Um, okay, um, and so, and uh, the last thing what you're gonna get is uh, my reading of 
the act of reading within these books, you know, the importance of the act of reading in, in the novels themselves. And uh, what I think reading also does to uh, the young adults who read the novels, okay? But this is the first part of my research. Then it would be interesting, but a much bigger project to actually test it with real teenagers, with real young adults, and see uh, if my findings um, have meaning. Okay, and um, I would like to start with two quotations that in a way frame my talk. Uh, the first one is the position statement on reading uh, of the National Council of Teachers of English in the United States. And um, it um, goes like this. Reading is the complex act of constructing meaning from print. We read in order to better understand ourselves, others, and the world around us. We use the knowledge we gain from reading to change the world in which we live. The second quote is from an Australian sociologist, Hugh McKay, and it's on happiness, which is, you know, the other topic in, uh, in my paper. And this is what he says. I actually attack the concept of happiness. I don't mind people being happy, but the idea that everything we do is part of the pursuit of happiness seems to me a really dangerous idea and has led to a contemporary disease in Western society, which is fear of sadness. We're kind of teaching our kids that happiness is the default position. It's rubbish. Wholeness is what we ought to be striving for, and part of that is, sad and part of that is sadness, disappointment, frustration, failure. All of those things which make us who we are. Happiness and victory and fulfillment are nice little things that also happen to us, but they don't teach us much. Ask yourself, is this contributing to my wholeness? And if you're having a bad day, it is. Okay, here I go. In a study done in 2009, Melanie D. Koss and William H. Thiel stated that young adult novels constitute an increasing market, resulting in a growth spurt in young adult literature. They collected a corpus of 370 titles published in English between 1999 and 2005 out of a pool of high quality, that is, award winning, winners, and popular books in order to get a clear picture of recent trends in young adult book publishing. Their findings, not surprisingly, suggested that the majority of popular and or award winning books are predominantly realistic in content. Uh, realistic fiction comprises about 47% of their corpus, uh, followed by fantasy, which is 12%, and science fiction at 3%. And then the rest is also realistic fiction, like uh, murder mystery and uh, historical fiction and things like that. These are concerned with typically adolescent themes, such as fitting in, finding oneself, and dealing with major life changes. Moreover, and what interests me in this talk, they found that hopeful endings are the predominant endings. Controversies abound surrounding children's and young adult literature. They range from what constitutes children's and adult literature to which topics and tones are appropriate. But the idea that children's and young adult literature must reassure its readers and provide positive models and feelings is still widely shared and represents, in the words of Perry Nodelman, an unspoken convention. The desire to instruct and please remain one of the distinctive features of literature for children and teens. However, along with the persistent notion that children need hope and happy endings, there exists also the idea that the end of innocence is the goal of any pedagogy and often marks the entrance of a young adult into adulthood. Children's author Natalie Babbitt sees happy endings as what makes a children's story different from one for adults. Even though not without pain, violence, or grief, in the end, these stories must reassure their readers that, as she says, everything will always be all right. And she's surely not alone. As Levo puts it, 
Good literature for children is supported to give comfort, and the lack of a happy ending upset readers who turn out to be, most often than not, adults. It's actually the adults who are disturbed by the unhappy endings. I think children can take them. Um, these adults complain that dark themes in young adult novels, such as those penned by Robert Cormier, for example, are inappropriate because they shatter innocence, lack hope, and promote nihilism. Author Anne Fine warned that books for the young are becoming so bleak and realistic that they're killing off youngsters' aspirations and called for stories to have happier endings to avoid depressing, impressionable readers. Whereas books in the past were full of fun and adventures that ended with all the loose ends being tied up successfully, she says, today's bleak and violent settings fail to offer them hope. Other writers believe instead that traditional literature does a disservice to young readers by holding out a skewed vision of a happy world awaiting them. Along similar lines, author Michael Mupurgo believes that children should be exposed to, life, uh, to life's difficulties along with its pleasures. While Cormier went as far as saying that when you give young people books with happy role models, you're telling them lies. Fortunately, the list of significant authors willing to disturb their young readers is rapidly growing. Next to Maurice Sendak's dislike for happy endings, uh, Neil Gaiman has recently stated, if you are protected from dark things, then you have no protection of, knowledge of, or understanding of dark things when they show up. And young adult dystopian author Lauren Oliver has claimed that in real life, there is no one point at which you get your happy ending. Among genres for children and young adults, dystopias embody this controversy, trigger important reactions in the readers, and require an active participation. Young adult dystopias, by their very nature, deal with dark times, much in, and much in line with critical dystopias, tend to offer open or not altogether unhappy endings. Through the combination of, of images of a bleak future with hope still possible, they interrogate the present, thus maintaining the potential to inspire the social dreaming that is central to utopia. But most of all, they can also call to action the readers. Such features make the young adult dystopian genre conducive to inspiring teenagers who are on the brink of adulthood and struggling with the social structures that seek to construct them. What Keith and Booker has said about dystopia in general becomes particularly appropriate for its young adult counterpart. And I quote, if the main value of literature in general is its ability to make us see the world in new ways, to make us capable of entertaining new and different perspectives on reality, then dystopian fiction is not a marginal genre." Unquote. And it is a genre that can make a difference. These novels may provide young adults with challenging stories that not only help them make sense of the world, but offer them means of resistance. Speaking of the fantastic, by which it does not mean the genre nor its commodification by the cultural industry. Jen Dives claims that through fantasy or imagination, we seek to make sense of the world. But most of all, he says, we do not need fantasy to compensate for dull lives, but for spiritual regeneration and to contemplate alternatives to our harsh realities. We need the fantastic for resistance." Unquote. If the definition of young adult uh, is pragmatic and there is no consensus on the age of young adult themselves, young adult literature does not fare much better and resists easy classification. Recent studies of the genre define it as writing in which the main characters are adolescents. It is often narrated in the first person and therefore may present a naive, limited point of view thus enabling identification with the narrator and encouraging empathy for the protagonist. And it often focuses on the relationship between the society and the individual, thus questioning social, social constructions. Although science fiction has at times been thought of as bad literature for boys, 
and therefore with a strong appeal for young adult readers, there is a general consensus that Lois Lowry's 1993 novel, The Giver, represents the turning point for the development of the young adult dystopia. But the text that can easily be identified as the catalyst for the explosion of the genre today is, without any doubt, Susan Collins' Hunger Games trilogy. Although earlier examples, such as M.T. Anderson's Feet, Nancy Farmer's The House of the Scorpion, and French author Anne Laure Bandeau's Lynn's Hop series were positively received, like Laurie's text, they enjoyed the second life after the enormous success of Collins' trilogy. A random look at commercial dystopian series and standalone novels reveals a wealth of titles that explore what the future could look like in post-apocalyptic scenarios. Philip Reeve's Mortal Engine series, uh, Scott Westerfield's Ugly series, Patrick Ness, Kyle's Walking, Yves Grovey, Mittal, Alison Condy, uh, Matched, Hugh Howie's Silo, Veronica Roth's Divergent Trilogy, Lauren Oliver Delirium, The Maze Runner series by James Dashner. Okay, these are all uh, some of the um, famous, uh, successful, sold a lot uh, series. Uh, there are also some standalone uh, novels like uh, Cory Doctorow's Little Brother, which is a great book, <laughs> uh, Seth Gardner's Mega Moon, and Gillian Cross After Tomorrow. Let me uh, just make a digression about this last one. After Tomorrow, I was trying to fit it, you know, in the presentation, um, but it didn't work. <laughs> um, it's a great book, uh, and it's so timely. Um, it uh, talks about um, England, you know, the United Kingdom, or what's left of it, um, after uh, what she calls Armageddon Monday, when the uh, banks crash. So the pound is worthless, uh, there's no food, and um, Exodus becomes, you know, one of the solutions. But the French cut the tunnel, closed the tunnel, and so the, the, the English people find themselves, you know, in refugee camps. And uh, I thought, you know, it would be a great novel to talk about today, but <laughs> uh, I had written a writing paper. <laughs> okay. Um, the presence of so many visions of future, uh, of futures worse than the present, raises the question not only of why such literature is so attractive to young adults, but also of its aesthetic qualities and political balances, as Balaka Basu, Catherine R. Broad, and Carrie Hint have remarked. These three critics break down their analysis to three major areas of contention. How these texts balance didacticism with pleasure, whether they espouse radical political change, and whether they offer their readers hope or despair. The second and third of these concerns, together with the development of critical reading and thinking, seem to me the most relevant today. The possibility that these texts, because of their exciting adventures and gripping plots, may be read ultimately as flights of fancy rather than projections of a possible future, is obviously a risk. But they, most, but they may also provide young adults with an encouragement to think about social and political issues in new ways, or even for the first time. Whether the young adult dystopian genre can be seen, and I quote, as inspiring change, or whether it has fallen short of its potential, unquote, is a question that cannot be answered easily. In order to test this idea, I intend to look briefly but carefully at two standalone novels and their slightly different targeted audiences. Um, in particular, I will look at the acts of reading and storytelling within these novels as indicators of the text's radical political balances. The act of reading, literally and metaphorically, within these novels can function as a mirror for the reading experience of young adults, as well as a stimulus to read on, as it were, since knowing how to read the world may also help to change the world in which we live. The control of literacy and the acts of reading and telling stories, in fact, are important features for the construction and the maintenance of totalitarian regimes. Oftentimes, these activities are also linked to the theme of memory and forgetting. Because the authoritarian state controls its subjects 
through the strict use of language and propaganda and the hegemonic narratives that are permitted to circulate, critical reading and storytelling can represent important tools of resistance, subversion, and catalyst for personal and communal agency. By reading about black futures and about how characters in those texts read and react to those futures, young adult readers are invited to imagine a future they desire and possibly enact changes in the present that can begin to build a future. And I'll start with my first text, uh, Mazzini's book. Reading and storytelling are central to the plot of Beatrice Mazzini's 2010 novel, Bambini and Bosco, uh, published in a series called Twins, thus indicating a target readership around the 10-14 age range. The story takes place in an indefinite future on a planet after a bomb has destroyed life on Earth. Children that have survived live on a base camp, a place seemingly modeled on a summer camp, but which in fact resembles a concentration camp. They are divided into lumps, which are small groups living in barracks called shells, and the children can be leftovers or survivors who have lost their parents, but who have shards, that is, fragmented and often traumatic memories of their previous lives that occasionally come to the surface and hurt them. Or they can be blossoms, or children who come from the cryopreservation systems and therefore have no memory or knowledge of the world. Despite their differences, they undergo the same treatment. They're constantly monitored. They're given pills that keep them in a state of tranquility and forgetfulness. They're brainwashed with uh, camps rules that are broadcast through loudspeakers twice a day. Don't think and you won't have any troubles. Don't enter the woods. Don't keep secrets. In this new life, characterized by scarcity and constant surveillance, children survive as best as they can. They obey orders, they fight among themselves for food as well as for no reason at all, and they're progressively becoming barbarians. Malnourished and deprived of memories, they can barely use words and are for the most part illiterate. Like any dystopia, the novel has its share of misfit characters. Tom, a young boy who feels and is described as different as he engages in small acts of rebellion, from not taking his pills to taking short tentative walks in the woods and trying to remember. And Jonas, one of the young supervisors who monitors the children from afar and is critical of the system and who hates the children's escape into the woods. The use of two misfits could be a strategy that allows different readers to identify differently. Younger readers may identify with Tom, while older readers could identify with Jonas. Tom stands apart from the others because in his solitary walks at the edge of the wood, he finds a book, and being a leftover, he knows how to read. The discovery of Tom's secret by Hannah, the group's hard and bossy leader, who nonetheless asks him, to share the stories with them, acts as catalyst for the transformation of the group. Reading the fairy tales and listening to stories that speak of the woods, of parents that die or abandon their children, and of houses made of fantastic food, the group finds the courage and hope needed to entertain the possibility of leaving the base camp and starting a search for a better life on their own. The group's resolution, therefore, both violates and resists the camp's laws and presents a challenge to the kids themselves. It is also through the act of reading that the leftovers try to recover memories as well as explain and teach the blossoms words and ideas they've never known before. Because the book, as Anna says, is what has stories and words within it, and Tom must read them all to them so that they can remember. And thus, slowly, they learn new words and with them the power of language. And so it is that reading allows the group to move from individual isolation and selfishness to small acts of cooperation and sharing. After a period in which Tom is not allowed any changes in the ritual readings and is required to repeat the exact words and the accompanying gestures of, of the words, 
the group learns new words that they use in more complex sentences. But words and reading also provide them with a sense of identity. As they resolve to, to leave the camp and find a better place, they name themselves the kids in the wood and state that they are about to become their own tale. Being different becomes a positive value as they enjoy their uniqueness. This is what Tom says. Before we were all the same, same as the others, and we were nothing. Now we are us. Tom becomes their new leader rather than their boss, and Hannah, who gives him a new name together with the title of new leader, becomes a leader herself, recovering and accepting her previously hidden identity as a leftover. But the book confers a new identity also to another character, actually the most insignificant uh, boy in the group, who is entrusted with the task of protecting the book, and, that, and thus he becomes the guardian or the keeper of the book. Knowledge and the power of language are inextricably linked with a sense of the past and its memory. Shards, the fragmented memories that haunt the, le the leftovers, are also a source of envy and jealousy among the group. Because if one has a memory, it means that they also have a past. As, and as Jonas says, without the past, it is more difficult to envision the future. The novel, however, complicates Jonas's point of view. As some of the younger children learn new words and risk reading their new lives and identities as an exciting adventure, they also become more demanding and rebellious. Hannah perceptively remarks, and I quote, it's like a great game. They have the memory of an ant. They have erased everything, the beatings, hunger, and loneliness. It's as if they were born here. They didn't have a past, therefore they do what they can. They enjoy the present and demand the future. They require it, unquote. Literacy brings with it a liberating force to be reckoned with. When you have the words, Tom thinks, you can say things, good ones and bad ones. You can protest and rebel. You want things. Without words, you can't. As they learn to deal with the power of language and its complexities, they also learn the importance of community. And with it, the principles of democracy and negotiation for what Ruth Levitas calls the education of desire. And I quote from the book, our strength is being together, and being together also means that we decide together, which doesn't mean that we decide the same thing, but that we choose that which the majority desire, unquote. The group becomes a community. They find a mutant animal and they tame it. They build a shelter. They keep track of time. They find another lost young girl and take care of her. Um, they share tasks and slowly affection. And they also face together the need to come to terms with death as another taboo <laughs> uh, topic in children's literature. As one of the children falls from climbing a tree. But most of all, they listen to the stories, discuss them, and ultimately trust them. They move, in fact, from the act of reading to that of creating their own stories, in the sense that they create new stories when they don't find one in the book that matches their experiences, and they trust that dreams and hope are in the stories as much as in the lives that they're creating. The book ends in a bittersweet way. Their encounter with death makes Hannah recognize the difference between fairy tales and life which cannot always have a happy ending, like the stories in the book. But the boy's death does not undermine or reduce the importance of stories. Once the adult in charge of the base discovers their escape, he sends Jonas into the woods to recover them and bring them back. It is as if the words conjured the adults, who up to that point were only an eerie absence. As Tom narrates his story, when they last expected, somebody comes and helps them. Mazzini's ending is somewhat ambiguous. A relatively happy ending compensates the fact that the children are brought back to the base. Mazzini does not seem to trust their younger readers with a story that will not reassure them with some, some, uh, some notion of normality, the good, that good adults exist, that they take care and save the children, 
that for some of them, the bleak future ends with the adoption on the part of couples and of one of the supervisors. For the rest of them, it is Jonas who will take care of them in an ending reminiscent of, of Ursula K. Le Guin's uh, famous short story, The Ones Who Walk Away from Omelas. They walk away back into the woods in search of other children and other stories to create. In terms of reading, the novel offers its share of frustration to our young readers as they need to be able and willing to postpone understanding and clarity. It is typically disorienting in that it starts in the middle and many of the features of the big future are made sense of only as the story progresses, which is very frustrating, I think, for, for children reading. Anxiety, loneliness, insecurity, selfishness, fear, and lack of affection and solidarity are the feelings experienced by the protagonists and transmitted to the readers. And a certain frustration results from the bittersweet ending that sees the dismemberment of the group. And yet, while the open ending works to reassure the readers that hope is possible, it may also deflect some of the book's strength. The vague extrapolation of the future and its social order may reassure contemporary readers that they do not need to fear such a future, since their present may not seem so bad in comparison, and as long as they live in the protection of their parents. And even in the event of a disaster, such fate can be countered by the intervention of good adults, just as fairy tales and the novel itself teaches. teaches yeah. And yet, <clears throat> the very act of reading within and outside of Mazzini's novel provides a metaphor and a reflection on the salvific power of language and words, of how personal and communal agency are still possible in the face of abuse and control. If the book within the story is a source of empowerment, rebellion, and resistance for the protagonists, similarly, the novel itself can be understood to represent a tool in the hands of young adults reading it. As Jonas's last words suggest, Books are useful anyway to preserve stories so that others may get to know them and, I would add, find inspiration in them. The next novel, Auntie Anderson's Feet. Although reading seems almost absent from the world imagined in Auntie Anderson's 2002 novel, Feet, it is the distinguishing element at the basis of its narrative of resistance. Set in a not so distant future America, the novel follows the story of Titus, the self-conscious young narrator who thinks of himself as being stupid, but is actually the product of a shallow, culturally impoverished society where writing is obsolete, reading is considered unnecessary, and art is absent. The culturally decadent and environmentally collapsing future America is governed by corporations where wealthy individuals are hooked up from birth to the feed, a kind of computer chip that connects them to the internet through brain, through brain implantation. With minimal extrapolation from our present, Anderson imagines that the feed enables instant wireless messaging and updates users on entertainment possibilities and commercial and social trends, responding to an individual's every thought with targeted advertising. Hence, Thoughts and desires are constantly monitored by corporate interests, making this future a grotesque, materialist utopia. One of the great advantages of defeat is, according to Titus, that you can be super smart without ever working, thus being provided with access to almost infinite quantities of data that remain, however, unused. Without being aware of the danger, Titus captures the real principle of defeat, and I quote, it knows everything you want and hope for, sometimes before you even know what those things are. It can tell you how to get them and help you make buying decisions that are hard. It can tell you, oh, sorry, <laughs> uh, everything we think and feel is taken in by the corporations and they make a special profile, one that's keyed just to you, unquote. By keeping teenagers and adults up to date about everything that is fashionable, the feed forces them to buy just for the sake of buying, without precedented speed. 
and in so doing, it profiles consumers and co-opts hope and desire. In this society of instant gratification, everything is disposable and trends come and go instantaneously. For example, during a party, two of Titus's girlfriends go off to the bathroom to change hairstyles because hairstyles had changed in those 20 minutes. And clearing the table after dinner means literally throwing dishes and table away. But perhaps one of the strongest indications of Anderson's consumer culture is the commodification of historical symbols of resistance and rebellion into what he calls the riot gear collection. Kent State culottes, Stonewall clogs, the Watts riot top, and the WTO riot windbreaker, these are all places of you know, rebellions in the 60s and 70s up to uh, obviously the WTO, which was in 2001, are co-opted into yet another act of consumption. Although Titus represents a society's average teenager obsessed with materialism, unlike his friends, is also somewhat uncomfortable and different. He does not qualify as dystopia's traditional misfit, as his discomfort is typical of teenage angst. He feels dumb, worries about the fact that he's not cool, and his identity depends almost entirely on his peers' approval. Like the majority of the population, including adults, uh, he is inarticulate and often at a loss for words, as corporate-owned schools' uh, main mission is to teach people how to be good consumers. Thus the novel, for example, registers Titus and his friends' recurring need to look up the odd words used by Violet, another character, a young woman they meet during their spring break vacation on the moon. And the words that they have to look up are fairly normal words for us. Separation, autumnal, contusions, okay? These are the words that they don't know. Titus can't write and barely knows how to read. But what's worse is that his illiteracy prevents him from reading the society as a dystopia. Meaning Violet, however, unsettles him and turns out to be a feeble education for Titus. Violet clearly represents the dystopian misfit and strike Titus as different, a weird yet intriguing individual amid a society of conformists. Uh, this is, you know, um, how he describes her at one point when he's very self-conscious about uh, what they're doing. She was watching her stupidity. Her manners and language set her apart as a critical and independent thinker so much so that at one point Titus tells her, it sometimes feels like you're watching us instead of being us. Unlike the majority of her peers, Violet is homeschooled and did not get the feed implanted in her brain until she was seven years old. A fact that makes her more vulnerable when the group is attacked by a terrorist hacker and they're temporarily disconnected from the feed. The attack turns out to be much more dangerous for Violet who slowly starts losing control of her basic functions and is left with a short amount of time to live. Her parents' choice are a sign of resistance, but also a reminder of the economic status and hence of their diminished citizenship. If Titus feels stupid, Violet is perceived both as too smart, pretentious, but also caught in the desire to be normal and be accepted. Violet is aware, however, of her contradictions, and unlike Titus, is also aware of the problem that a feed control society creates. In one of the central passages of the book, originated by a reflection on the part of, Tid uh, on the part of Titus about Violet, who is always reading uh, things about how everything was dying in the society, she tells Titus, uh, she explained to Titus uh, the difference you know, between democracy and the problem of representation, when only 73% of the American population can afford the feed, and concludes, and I quote, when you have to feed all your life, you're brought up to not think about things. Because of the feed, we are raising a nation of idiots, ignorant, self-centered idiots, unquote. The act of, and skill of reading and writing, as well as your fluency with words, are that which distinguishes Violet and turns her into an activist. 
brought up in a home where in Titus words, everything had words on it, papers, books, and even posters on the wall. She plans to resist defeat through acts of consumer disobedience. By choosing random, unrelated items over defeat without buying them, she creates what she says, what she calls a customer profile that's so screwed, no one can market to it, and prevents the corporation from profiling her. Unfortunately, her purchasing history is also what makes her an unprofitable investment for the corporations that turn her down and let her die. But Violet's resistance is not limited solely to her acts of consumer disobedience. It is also enacted through language and the protection of memory. Having lost one year of her memory because of her malfunctioning feet, Violet starts sending Titus files of her memories so that he can preserve them, read them, and eventually tell them back to her. She also plans to live fully her remaining days and drafts a list of things she wants to do before she dies. Her list becomes Violet's modest utopia. 22 items that makes simple, achievable wishes like dancing, seeing heart, and going to the mountains with questions like, is there any moss anywhere? And more impossible yearnings like getting older, seeing the years pass, and being without a feet. But the list turns into a narrative of a life that did not and is not going to happen. A critical, nostalgic vision of what could have been. Faced with the daunting task of accompanying Violet in her last days, Titus does not rise to the occasion, and his actions preempt Violet's acts of resistance. He pretends he has not received Violet's files and deletes all the memories. But Anderson's disturbing ending and choice uh, to show Titus in a very negative light can actually force readers to resist identification with the protagonist while asking them to interrogate their own action. And as Elizabeth Bullen and Elizabeth Parson have noted, while Violet is the challenging and questioning actor, Titus embodies Sigmund Bauman's regrettable yet excusable position of the bystander. Since readers are experiencing the story and its world through Titus, whose actions are unlikable, they are simultaneously invited to reject and critique both actions and society. The novel ends ambiguously as far as Titus' resistance is concerned, and once again, it is the mention of a book that makes a difference. Or may make a difference. <laughs> um, during a very harsh confrontation with Violet's father, who informs Titus of his daughter's impending death, he's invited to go back and hang with the Eloi. Titus doesn't understand the word Eloi, and Violet's father refuses to explain the H. E. Wells reference from the time machine and tells a frustrated Titus to go read it. Similarly, to make sense of it, the readers are placed in the same position as Titus and are thus invited to find out for themselves the meaning of the reference and hence to read and value the act of reading. Although we're not told if Titus follows Violet's father's invitation, his actions indicate a modest change, Titus's own way of, resi of resistance. At Violet's deathbed, he starts talking to her, trying to become Violet's memory and memorial. He researches and reads on the feed the kind of strange facts that interest interested Violet and goes back to tell them to her. And in the act of storytelling, he also tries to resist the feat. It's the first time that he actually manages to resist the feat. Um, and I quote, I tried to talk just to her. I tried not to listen to the noise of the feet, the girls in wet shirts offering me shampoo. I told her stories that were only a sentence long, each one of them. That's all I knew how to find. So I told her broken stories, the little pieces of broken stories I could find. I told her what I could, unquote. But if he can only offer her fragments of stories, he also tries to remember Violet and to reconstitute her dismembered body through the act of remembering and storytelling. And I quote a little longer. 
passage. There's one story I'll keep telling you. I'll keep telling it. You are the story. I don't want you to forget. When you wake up, I want you to remember yourself. I'm going to remember. You're still there, as long as I can remember you, as long as someone knows you. This is the story. I told her the story of us. It's about the film, I said. It's about this mad normal guy who doesn't think about anything until one wacky day when he meets a dissident with a heart of gold. Set against the backdrop of America in its final days, it's the high-spirited story of the love together. It's laugh out loud funny, really heartwarming, and a visual feast. Together, the two crazy kids grow, have madcap escapades, and learn an important lesson about love. They learn to resist the feet. Rated PG-13 for language and mild sexual situations." Unquote. This, heap, this heap of broken recollection, this simplified story narrated in a Hollywood commercial style, is all titles can offer to honor Violet's memory. But in his, in his storytelling, he rewrites Violet's futile resistance and his own failure to break free from the constraints of society. Like Violet's narrative of a life that is not going to be, Titus uses a creative, utopian nostalgia to imagine what could have been, to desire an alternative ending. In terms of reading, feet can be very frustrating, both for language, an inventive teen jargon Anderson creates, and of course, the unhappy ending. Despite the bleak ending, Violet's acts of resistance and Titus's more modest rebellion constitute a utopian experiment that disrupts the perception of the society and our own, and attempts to offer an alternative set of, <coughs> of values. Despite the fact that the protagonist ultimately fails to, fail to resist, the novel's epistemological process positions readers to adopt a more critical awareness of their own world as well as of the society portrayed in the novel. Unlike Mazzini's novel and many commercial young adult dystopias, and as Carter F. Hansen also noted with regard to Feet, rather than providing an elsewhere that distances the reader from the contemporary social condition and economic modes of post-industrial capitalism, Anderson extrapolates a future based on entirely familiar consumer habits and internet technology. Anderson's limited extrapolation makes it easy for readers to recognize the assonances between their present and the future society, and more difficult, I think, to write them off as flat of fancy. The double movement to identify with the protagonist and also resist such identification may encourage readers to exercise agency. Despite the unhappy ending that sees the narrative punishment of Violet and limited agency from Titus, Storytelling, imagination, and a re-evaluation of the literal and metaphorical act of reading are some of the tools of resistance and can provide an example. Feet presents a dystopian society that the male protagonist, as well as readers, may not read as such at first. It is through Tyler's interaction with Violet that he achieves a feeble critical distance from his own society. Thus the novel enacts an epistemological process whereby readers, by recognizing Titus' world as dystopian, can also learn to read their own world in a new, critical way. Far from showing that utopia can be reached, the reading of young adult dystopia can show the critical process necessary for the education of desire. And I'm going to conclude. And uh, I'll start my conclusion with another quote from uh, Neil Gaiman's very famous talk uh, that he gave at the Reading Agency Lecture, maybe some of you know it. Uh, this is what he says. Fiction can show you a different world. It can take you somewhere you've never been. Once you've visited other worlds, you can never be entirely content with the world you grew up in. And discontent is a good thing. People can modify and improve their worlds, live them better, live them different, if they're discontented. In the foreword to Hint and Austria's volume on utopian and dystopian literature for children and young adults, Jeff Dykes, recognizing that we live in very troubled times, 
states that more than ever before, we need utopia and dystopian literature. We need literature then that challenges and disturbs young adult readers. As E.B. White said, children should not be written down to, but written up to. Using challenging themes, complex visions, and unsettling endings, writers can motivate readers. As Zipes also remind us, without discontent, there is no utopia. When asked whether young people can handle dystopia, Lois Lowry replied, and I quote, young people handle dystopia every day, in their lives, their dysfunctional families, their violence within schools. They watch dystopian television and movies about the real world where firearms bring about explosive conclusions to conflict, unquote. By doing away with the unspoken convention of happy endings, the bleak futures imagined in these novels do not renounce hope, but invite Anderson's young readers to resist and Mazzini's younger ones to negotiate between relief and awareness. The characters of both novels educate themselves and are educated into a displacement of and a critique of the societies they live in. In this open world where diversity is discouraged, to portray characters that resist and exercise agency is an important message for young adults who tend to embrace conformity in their need to fit, to fit in and belong. But reading in particular allows teens to play with their identities in a safe and controlled manner. Because adolescence is that time in which teens attempt to define themselves and construct subjectivity, Reading young adult dystopia can promote alternative thinking and create hope for change. Utopia is neither reached nor accomplished at the end of the novels, but a utopian dimension is maintained for the readers and is fostered through hope and the education of desire. The encounter with an imperfect botched utopian experiment served to create a space in which the reader is both brought to experience an alternative and called to judgment on it. Through a process that Tom Moylan has called one of pleasure and pedagogy, the function of utopia moves from being merely that of goal and catalyst of change to one of criticism. Thus, utopia's function is not only that of promoting change, but through the act of reading, it becomes one of developing criticism, and the same, of course, can be said for dystopia. Reading is at the basis of the cognitive estrangement needed to achieve a critical perspective on our own world and an understanding of what is necessary to begin to, to articulate our desires with concrete actions in order to challenge the inequities of our societies. In this light, the ambiguity of unhappy endings serves to disturb, challenge, and motivate young adults. By resisting the convention of reassuring readers the futures foreshadowed in these dystopian novels do not foreclose hope. They actually interpolate young adult readers to intervene critically in the imagination and construction of a future they desire and to possibly do something in their present that can begin to build a future. Thank you. Thank you very much for this very rich and thought-provoking talk. I'm sure that the audience has lots of comments and questions to pose to you. So, we have about half an hour for discussion, so you have plenty of room. Who would like to start? Thank you. Uh, I thought I could ask you the same question you asked about you in the earlier session, which is that in, in what sense or to what extent is it possible to separate the, the level of uh, the allegorical um, engagement with the struggles of youth from the actual dystopic elements of the today's risk society and so forth in these, these narratives? Or is it like, um, as a researcher, do you have to grapple with the question? Um, 
Yeah, that's that's uh, that's of course a, diff a difficult um, question in a way, um, in the sense that we're also dealing, I think, with the dystopian uh, phenomenon now, um, with a very you know rich marketing uh, strategy, right? And so it's kind of difficult to uh, separate um, some of the works who say something, I think, and challenge, uh, you know, readers without being preaching, though, because I think that that's the, the good thing about these, uh, these novels, that they're not didactic or, um, you know, by uh, separating them from, from, you know, other more successful novels um, that compromise, though, that radical vision, I think, especially in the ending. I'm thinking of, you know, like the ending of uh, Hunger Games, you know, it, it starts in a very positive way, I think, at least I was very excited when I read the first volume, then my enthusiasm kind of like diminished on the second, and then, you know, raised up again on the third, and then when we got to the ending, you know, it's such a traditional back to, you know, family values, you know, living together, I mean, all the rebellion um, that Katniss proposes, it's, it's kind of peters out. You know, by the end, um, and so you know, as often is the case with uh, you know with a young adult, I think in particular, you know, you're faced with um, like with the vampire books. You know, there's a good, <laughs> good. I don't know. I have to admit that I never read the Twilight Saga. So, uh, but anyway, there's a good successful uh, vampire story, and then you know, uh, another hundred come. Uh, that are mostly repetitive and, uh, and don't really add much uh, to the story. Um, so I think that that's you know that's something to to look for, uh, to watch out for. Um, and um, I think as readers we, we we try to find we need to find ways uh, on how to in a way you know, separate some of those stories and, and, and see how they work. Um, again, not to uh, I think it, it, it's also revealing, uh, I don't know whether you follow it, you know, the um, controversy, you know, it's like um, about Hunger Games, when the, when the film came out, and now, you know, it's like my age comes out, I can't remember the name of the, of the protagonist, but anyway, the, 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 the young kid that, that um, teams up with Katniss in the first volume, that gets killed. It's uh, rude. District. Rue, I Rue. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, I mean, like huge portion of the population were upset because Rue was black, you know, portrayed uh, in the film as black uh, because they didn't read it that way. So I mean, there is a fear. That, I mean, there is a danger that these books are read, you know, as just for the plot, as uh, as I was saying, quite fancy. You know, that is, uh, I think, uh, um, a real problem. Okay, um, a slight wondering kind of about the paradox of young adults' dystopias, because the concept of dystopia is sort of necessitates an understanding of the context of what the dystopia is referring to. And when we take a readership, you know, targeted to young adults, which are kind of teenagers, not quite adults, they might not have the context in mind yet at the time. And one of the problems for me for reading books like this is that they have all these really, really fascinating themes pertaining to the past, you know, language, things like memory. And the way that they're handled ultimately hits this kind of wall when you have to gear them towards that age group that are predominantly reading it. And that kind of, you know, you were mentioning how certain endings might be a bit watered down because you have to, you know, retain happy endings or something like that. And even if you don't have happy endings, the way that these elements are kind of dealt with might be a bit simplified. Mm -hmm. And in a sense, that's understandable if the readers are the you know, target demographic. And, you know, that if, if the purpose is just to inspire and sort of awaken an idea of rebellion or whatever. But I was wondering, as an adult, is there any kind of objective quality to reading young adult dystopias when I, as a 
grown-up person who can understand a bit further than, let's say, a 15-year-old. And I would sort of demand uh, even sort of, what's a good word for it, more insights to the subject at hand. So what do you think, uh, as an obviously an adult reader, what would you say is the biggest sort of in incentive for an adult to read books, is that especially dystopian young adult books that are meant for teenagers and might not sort of dwell into those subjects as much as an adult reader would like to hear about? Okay, yes. Um, well, two things, first of all, uh, that come to mind. I mean, it, it, in a way that doesn't seem to, to, to be the need for an incentive, in, in the sense that uh, adults consume you know, young adult novels a lot. Um, and, uh, for example, Feed um, was just uh, published, you know, a new edition was published as, uh, as an adult uh, dystopia, not as a young adult dystopia. It only changed the cover, so it was just, again, I think, uh, a marketing ploy, but, but uh, and tells you something about Feed, which I think it's, it's special, as, you know, in the, in the world of, uh, uh, young adult dystopias, um, because it's, it's really uh, of another level to some extent. Um, so there doesn't seem to be, um, you know, need in terms of, uh, but, but you're right. I mean, some of the young adult dystopias can, can, uh, can be um, a little too simplistic, and you think that adults read them for the same reasons, just as they like the adventures, they like the plot, it's, it's a good uh, flight of fantasy. There's nothing wrong. You know uh, about that, but I but I like to think that dystopia, you know, you know can also have uh, uh, something more. I think again the, the age difference um, can um, or the age range can can uh, make a difference in the kind of plot that is written. Um, so that I think there are some young adult dystopias that are a little more. Um, accurate in the in the kind of society the problems that set up uh, and others you know that are very vague and they serve i mean it's like they're very useful i think nonetheless uh, for young adults because they really talk to them about their struggles you know um, with the parents with the society um but you know not necessarily read at, at those levels Hey, thank you very much for that. That was, that was really um, instructive, especially for someone like me who hasn't really looked at um, the, the dystopian um, literature as, as, as well as, as, or as much as, as other people in the room. Um, but my, my question kind of ties back to the, the couple of previous ones, which is um, the, the question of audience and the question of, of the, the kind of certain kinds of ethical complexities that, that come with these issues. And, and one of the things that I was thinking of while you were speaking about Feed was uh, Jeff Ryman's Air, which is another novel which has this idea of a sort of telepathic internet um, being connected to a new person. Uh, but this time, the, the interesting thing about the book is that the, um, the main character of that book is the most unlikely main character of science fiction, which is a mother. <laughs> And, and one of the things that, that annoyed me a little bit about Feed is again that situation that you have a female character who's basically sacrificed for the for the yes. enlightenment of the male character. Absolutely. So, so would you like to say, having written so much about gender issues as well, would you like to say a little bit more about the, the kind of gender balance in in YA and dystopia at the moment? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, that's a that's a great question. Uh, as a matter of fact, and one that I haven't touched here because it would you know, open a huge, I think, kind of worms, <laughs> to some extent. Um, yeah, um, it's interesting because, I mean, uh, of course, I think, I think you, you may have perceived that, you know, my way of reading this stuff is, is also very political, and, uh, and I think that the um, spurt, you know, of, uh, of this stuff is just young adults, but in general, of these uh, last 15 days, in a way, um, at least for me, uh, speak to 9-11, right? Um, and, uh, and it's interesting what you're saying. Now, look forward also, look forward to hearing some of the other presentations because I think that one of the first answers, you know, one of the first responses of, you know, literature in general, but specifically of science fiction and, 
uh, dystopian um, in general, was, uh, was uh, a very conservative answer is where gender, women, were killed off, okay? So Violet uh, is, you know, it's traditional in that, you know, she's uh, narratively punished, but at least she's a strong character. You know, in the other uh, stories, I mean, um, I don't know how you feel, but take uh, The Road, Cormac McCarthy, I mean, the mother, is out of the picture right away, right? Uh, she get kills off um, at, the, at the beginning. Um, in, uh, in, um, in films like Spielberg's um, uh, World of the Worlds or uh, other, you know, blockbusters, um, they all start with a, a weakened, right, uh, paternal figure who uh, becomes, you know, uh, in a way, recovers his, his masculine strength by the end of the film by protecting the family, by protecting his children, or his estranged wife, or whatever, right? So there is that plot. And so uh, when, when Katniss <laughs> arrived to go back again to, um, to Hunger Games, where the virgin is pretty much the same, right? Um, at first it was really um, exciting. Um, but then, you know, from a gender perspective, they're not really that interesting. I mean, it's like it, it's a little bit more than uh, uh, that what we've had, but it's still problematic. And uh, I think that you know, in, in the, the artistic responses so far, uh, we're seeing really this idea of, of reconstituted masculinity and you know, and uh, femininity that gets uh, silenced. You know. I haven't seen something that has really uh, excited me <laughs> recently. If you do have, you know, actually, I'll, I'll get to read the, the, that novel. <laughs> Thank you for your presentation. I'm interested in the combination of fairy tales and dystopias. So that's why I ask you, uh, you mentioned in Massini's novel, the children, they read fairy tales to mm -hmm. each other, and it kind of brings hope, elements of hope to the story. So is it a common element, a common topos in, in these young adult dystopias that children or whoever read um, fairy tales, and those fairy tale elements? Um, I think, um, you know, if, I, if I go back to the, the think rapidly, you know, of the of my corpus. I think that this is like the the, the only one where I found, uh, you know, such a clear uh, reference to. I mean, you could obviously understand, right? Children being uh, left in the, in the abandoned by by their parents or uh, the house of food. So they're really recognizable, even if they're not mentioned. Right? It's obviously uh, the the kind of fairy tales that we all know. Um, but I think that that's, you know, the, the only one. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, yeah, no, I think we could the only one, yeah. It's like, um, for example, Jack, Jack Dykes has connected, mm -hmm. his book also has connected fairy tale with utopia, so it might be like those fairy tales, stuff like fairy tales, for some mm -hmm. utopia. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Well, the other uh, actually, as, as we were talking, as, as you were talking, the other dystopia that comes to mind is uh, uh, Jane Yolden, but it's not really for young adults. It's for adults. It's uh, Briar Rose. I don't know if any of you know it. It's uh, um, a retelling or a retelling the, of the fairy tales or in a, in a novel about the Holocaust to the. Um, it's said like this sounds really weird, but it's a great novel. <laughs> Thank you for your presentation. Um, I would like to go back to the uh, commercial success of the young adult dystopia because it has been such a huge and interesting phenomenon. Uh, I think one 
One reason for the success might be that these um, young adult dystopias seem to fit very well to be like adapted to films and to computer games and other kind of from products. Um, why do you think it is so? What is the thing about young adult dystopia that is so easily you know, adapted to other uh, modes of fiction? Um, uh, well, <laughs> um, I, you know, I would be almost tempted to 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 say. I mean, at times I have a feeling that these books are written already with the idea that hopefully they will be picked up uh, to to you know be turned into into a movie. I mean, uh, um, I, mean I, I don't know. Sometimes I have that distinct feeling, you know, that that. You know, they end the chapters end on a you know cliffhanger, so that it's almost uh, reminds you of uh, of the writing for you know writing for movies. Um, I don't know. Um, that's uh, that's really a good question, and um, and um, you know, it's it would be interesting also to to ask authors. <laughs> you know the, this question because probably they may have uh, a better answer than, a, than the one I can uh, I can give you. Um, but I was wondering, for example, in the case of uh, uh, Mazzini's novel, uh, once again, you know, I, I I kind of wonder whether there isn't also uh, a mechanism of uh, almost self censorship uh, at times or or whatever that I'm not saying you know rationally, but they that they think already. I mean, Given that she 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 works in the publishing houses, she knows how what what the publishing house expects and, and things like that. Uh, that you know these authors may also uh, in a way direct their fiction in a way that uh, they will sell basically and it will be accepted and, and successful. Um, but I don't know. You know. <laughs> okay. Any more comments, questions? I'm always interested in the way that story gets used in politics and obviously you've been talking about these things which are very political and they're encouraging the views that people should rebel against these authoritarian states. Now, earlier on when you were talking about the, the sad condition of the newly distributed kingdom and having lived through the referendum myself and listened to the political argument it was very clear to me that the Leave campaign was selling the story of a country oppressed by faceless bureaucrats in Brussels mm -hmm. and the need to fight for freedom and stand on our, our own feet. So the, the idea of this rebellion thing is, is perhaps not necessarily a positive thing. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, that, that's, you know, um, as we always say, I mean, that is perhaps one of the central questions of utopia and dystopia, that, you know, my utopia may not necessarily, you know, be a utopia for somebody else. And, and, uh, and I think that this is certainly a case. Um, and it's also, I mean, I don't know, I've, I've, I've not lived through, I mean, I don't live in, in, in the UK, so, but reading, um, you know, the, the, the reports, the news, and, uh, um, it's certainly a, a very complex uh, issue, but it's also it's also being presented also as a clash between youth and uh, and older people. I don't know if, if that's oh well, um, absolutely, it's been a clash between youth and older people. As far as, far as younger people, though, they mm -hmm. voted about seventy five percent to remain in the EU because they're they're reasonably smart and they know that their economic future depends upon mm -hmm. it. The yeah. older people, on the other hand, were all for, for rebelling, and, and, which is really quite weird. Yeah. Yeah, what we want to say. But I think the same thing is happening in America. The whole Trump campaign is, is, is being sold on the, the you know, we are being oppressed by the federal government, and, and we must go hide in our bunkers in Montana and stop up on guns. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's the you know the other uh, the other thing I would say is you know how utopia. As being co-opted, you know, in in, uh, in the past, 
you know, for many years, I think, but it's really become sort of a, an individual utopia more than a collective uh, utopia. It's a utopia, a selfish utopia, almost. I'm thinking also of, a, of the United Kingdom, right? It's my right, or it's my right to carry arms and weapons, or, you know, in the States, it's, it's like it's what I want, not um, a better than not. Sure. So I'm mean, bringing that then to the, back to the young adult thing, I think that young adults pretty much all live in an oppressive authoritarian dystopia. Their mm -hmm. parents don't have the schools, they're not allowed to vote yeah. and so on. And, and they need to rebel against that, obviously. But come the end of the series, what they need to come back to is the realisation that they live in society mm -hmm. and that they can't just go off on their own and do whatever they want. Yeah, that's true. Um, although there are, I think, better ways of doing it. Uh, um, and I'm thinking of, uh, I don't know if you, if you know, Carrie Doctor's little brother. Oh, yes. You know, I mean, that is a kid who rebels and, you know, and, but also, um, you know, at one point has, a, has the support of some of the adults and, uh, and I think he comes back uh, in a different way as, uh, as you know, 100 games to go back to, <laughs> to that. So there is still some room for a few comments or questions. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, uh, when dystopia is written for young adults, uh, how do you think it shows? Uh, is it targeted towards a specific generation, like Generation Y, Millennials, Digital Natives, etc.? Uh, that is for people who grow up in this current world and its perils, uh, which might imply that in 20 years the current YA dystopias are just regarded as normal dystopias written for adults. Um, or are the books written uh, easy, watered down, to avoid subjects deemed too adult or preaching? Uh, or is it just a marketing trick where you can take all world's animal farm and call it children's dystopia because it's an animal fable? And if uh, YA dystopia isn't defined by any of these qualities, is it then relevant to even use the term? Uh, sorry, which term? Young adult or, uh, or, or dystopia? So, young adult dystopia. Oh, okay. Um, okay. Uh, well, uh, again, this is, I think, goes back to some of the questions and, and the different levels of, of reading a text, obviously. And, um, um, yes, yeah, certainly Animal Farm sometimes is, you know, has been uh, assigned as a, as, a, as a reading in junior high schools or something like that. And, and of course it can be read. Uh, but, you know, that's kind of true of, um, of any kind of uh, work. You know, I'm thinking of Disney films, right? You know, Disney films have two narratives. They have one for uh, the kids and then one for the parents that accompany them and, uh, and maybe that's maybe that's something to keep in mind also the idea you know one of the things that, that we have to think about when we talk about children's literature a little bit less perhaps with young adults but anyway that it's a literature uh, that is chosen oftentimes by the adults so that it also has to speak to uh, to the adults to some, to some extent and so maybe um, that may be also one of the reasons. I'm going to piggyback that and your pre previous answer to me slightly, because at the beginning of the lecture you mentioned uh, about the fact that while some people would rather not include darker themes in the children's stories, then I think it's also really relevant to deal with more difficult topics. And for that example, I think sometimes children's literature is better at dealing with that on those several levels all at once rather than the young adult books. For example, as Ripley Green's Brother Lionheart is a really, really good book for children about death and in a way that adults can also really, really relate to because it is vague in that way that you mentioned that some young adult books are more vague than others and those kind of help gear them towards 
several age groups at once. So I was wondering, do you have recommendations for novels or books that are more like this, that are slightly more vague in a way that they might not be quite as contemporary or hip or <laughs> fashionable in the sense that they, the way that you know, Hunger Games and stuff like that are, which kind of tie so directly to reality that when you are in an adult, you can kind of pinpoint the places where it is too simplistic. So which novels like um, in the dystopian young adult sphere do you think are more vague in that sense that would work for several age groups all at once? Um, I'm not sure um, I totally got your question. So you asked me, you know, like titles? I mean, okay. This okay. is basically recommendations. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I, I, I guess my preference would go for standalone novels, uh, for one thing. Um, although some of the uh, series are, are also very entertaining and, uh, and fun, um, but I, you know, my sense is that you cannot maintain the same level uh, throughout, the, throughout the series. Um, so, in a very interesting, very different uh, kind of book, I think, is, um, um, do you remember the name? Sally Gardner, uh, Maggot Moon, I don't know if any of you um, have heard of, uh, this is a, actually an alternate history, so, um, a vision of the future if, you know, what if uh, something had gone a different way. And it's actually uh, written from the perspective of a dyslexic kid and um, makes it for an interesting reading. You know, very frustrating, but, but also uh, very interesting. Um, I recently finished, um, well, you know, Terry Doctors, as I said, uh, Little Brother, I found that. Pretty, um, pretty inspiring, pretty, um, pretty political also. I mean, for for young adults, I mean, very open about torture, about uh, security, and uh, um, in the United States. Um, uh, what else? Okay, I, of course, now nothing comes to mind. Um, <laughs> Um, there's, uh, there's another book, but it's not, um, it's not a young adult dystopias, but I really enjoyed it uh, recently, and that's Station Eleven. I don't know if any of you have heard about it or read the book, but I can't remember the author. It's a woman, uh, something... St. John. St. John, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I think that we'll now have two questions, so we have spent a lot of time discussing, so... Thank you very much. Um, to go back to the previous session of um, agency, I think that, I don't know much of this book, it seems to me, based on your talk, that these are very different books in terms of agency, mm -hmm. because it sounds like in this book it's also about intersubjective or collaborative agency, or mm -hmm. Would you say something more about that? Because I think that in Anderson, one of the reasons why Violet fails is that she's so alone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think that that's you know one of the one of the nice things about um, about Mazzini is really this sense of uh, community that gets developed, um, which is um, which is a good thing, you know, for, for especially for uh, that age. You know, and I'm thinking, you know, the 10, 14 uh, kind of uh, age range. Um, I don't know, I just got out of it with my kid. You know, so it was like a you know, um, terrible, terrible period, you know, bullying and uh, all this sort of thing. So I think it, in that sense, it's a, it's a very positive um, message um, that compensates perhaps some of the less radical. Uh, you know, message that you will find in the book um, because they, they really create um, a community 
Okay, I will ask the last, last question as, as the chair. So I was interested in the term reward, which you mentioned a bit earlier, when you discussed that the protagonist has to have some reward at the end of the story. In a sense, if you think of young adult dystopia, one way of looking at the feature of hope at the end of the story is to think that it's a utopian impulse and it's a message for the readers. But another way of looking at it is to discuss it in terms of poetic justice, which is an old convention in literature, that the literary the fictional universe has to be good and righteous. And in a sense, in the Hunger Games, the ending where Peta and Katniss finally um, find each other and fight and get healed for their depression and marry. That's in a sense, one could also think that this is the convention for justice. There has to be some reward for those who have fought against the totalitarian state and given so much of their youth for the rebellion. So, would, would you comment on this? Um, yeah, uh, that is certainly one way of, of looking at it. And I think that, in particular, I mean, it is, uh, in a way, an idea underpinning uh, children's and, uh, and young adult um, stories, you know. Uh, the kids go through a lot of ordeals and terrible things, but in the end, you know, there's something, I mean, they, they learn that uh, they can find ways, you know, together or, you know, resourceful, hopefully not waiting for somebody to kiss them, you know, because I think that that's kind of problematic, um, but that they, you know, um, they can find ways to, to uh, make it, right? Um, in that sense, I think that feed is is uh, is more radical in a way, uh, more depressing, <laughs> certainly. Um, but in a way, I think that what's interesting is that he, uh, I mean, the author tries to attain, you know, something by breaking with that uh, with that convention, by frustrating uh, the sense of justice. Um, which does not mean that, you know, actually probably that's one way so that the kids want to do more. Or at least that's what I think I got also from my students, you know, when teaching them feed. <laughs> it comes a little bit also from my discussion with them. <laughs> okay. Let's thank Rafael once again. Thank you.